everyone. This presentation is going to be going through 971 and our leadership structure. My name is Laura. I'm the co-president on the team and I'm involved with Mechanical and I'm the lead for entrepreneurship. So I'm Stefan Assault. I'm one of the mentors on the team. My focus areas are a couple of them, competition, entrepreneurship, but overall the leadership of the structure of the team. So coaching our students and uh, today we want to kind of take you on the journey of the last three years of our team changing its leadership structure, why and how. Um, I'm going to kick off with a little bit of the background of it and then Laura will show how this works out today in our setup. But before I start, who of you are currently having a leadership role in their team? Great, then I got the right <laughs> audience here. That's important for me. Good. So as most of you probably know, Spartan uh, Robotics, we're 20 years old, um, we're a school club. That gives us an interesting dynamic. Um, everybody's welcome, everybody can join. Um, but we're also at the same time uh, a, a team with a lot of mentors. We're not a teacher program. So um, most of what we're doing is a bunch of mentors that work together with students, mentors out of the industry, and, and bring their knowledge and their know-how there. And then most of them also are alumni of the team. I'm not, but most, most of them are. Um, as you also know, the room next to us proves that, you know, we love designing robots and in the, in the, most of the time our team has been around building a lot of robots and designing them. So traditionally we have not had a very strong reputation in doing a lot around it. And if we are doing outreach or entrepreneurship, it's usually very robot related, like the parts that we made, Spartan Sports and all that kind of stuff. But in the broader outreach and entrepreneurship, as we like to call it nowadays, we, we kind of have a way to go. Then, in the last four years, our team suddenly started to grow. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think uh, uh, more interest in STEM in general, uh, the team performing really well at competitions, and um, uh, I think more promotion of what we're doing here at school. Today, our roster is over 120 students. Um, being responsible for such a group of people, um, I won't say it keeps me awake at night, but sometimes I do have a hard time getting to sleep. Um, what we did notice around 2020 is that the traditional leadership structure that we knew and have worked with for all these years was kind of getting to a point that we couldn't expand more and we couldn't let it function in the way that we liked. And so we started a discussion amongst mentors and with our students, specifically our leadership students, like what can we do better? Now, before we get to the better, how, how were we organized? And maybe this is very familiar for a lot of teams that are uh, Sorry, I need to stay within these lines. Um, <laughs> uh, that are familiar with how you organize clubs and, and uh, robotics teams, but um, we had presidents that were mostly there because every club in a school has to have a president. So we had co-presidents. One did um, basically uh, outreach. The other was kind of responsible for the rest around the, 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 the team packaging, training. And you can see we randomly divided that up. There was not a real philosophy like why is that there and why is that there. The other part was the captain. Now the captain is the de facto leader of the team in this model. You know, that person runs everything. It's kind of the design wizard, competition uh, a leader, uh, all the responsibilities you can come up with around competition and robot work concentrated on this person. Um, great role to have, but also very demanding. And the other part is that every gray box you see here was a leader. Um, and I'm not kidding, we at some point had 30 lead positions, roles, that were created over time, and we had 50 members at the time. Um, I cannot exactly say you how I feel about it, but it was kind of an overkill in terms of like too many leaders, too little people that were actually executing stuff. So over the time we said like, some of these roles are so singular, like, um, and, and they're still important, but they were really focused on like we had a, a lead for the bumper. And that is a role you have during the whole season, maybe for one, two weeks. It's a very important role because, you know, you want to have your bumpers right, but it kind of became hilarious if you look at it in, in, you know, in the rearview mirror that we had such a very narrow se segmentation of all these roles. So what we did is we started looking at, like, what is a better way to organize a team like this? Um, okay, so what we did, instead of going with that other structure, is we, we changed the structure where we have four leadership roles, top level roles that are equally important. So to start with, of course, a mechanical, mechanical lead, which was traditionally the captain. That is a person that's responsible for build, designing, manufacturing the robot and getting a fixed robot, a ready robot for the team. Then there is a software lead. That is, the name is very obvious, is a person that is responsible for getting all the software ready. And again, 
ready all the way up for the season to go to a competition. What we introduced next to that are two equally important roles. One is the entrepreneurship role, which is Laura, and she will tell more about how she does that. And the other one is our competition lead, who is in the back there, Thea, um, who is solely responsible for making us competition ready. It's very important. That means driver practice. That means packing, you know, when we go to a competition. Uh, but also, during the competition, all the activities that make us competition ready, scouting, strategy, all these things, are a responsibility of that person. They are part of a leadership council. So we have broadened the leadership of the team to a leadership council that also has a secretary and treasurer and has a leadership council of between five and ten students. Right now it's ten. And these form the core of our leadership. Now a couple of things that are important about that last part. So if you're a student on this team, you're always welcome to join our leadership meetings. You can just come in. You're always welcome to raise your hand and do stuff. But the Leadership Council is basically the group of students that we, as mentors, first look at when we have something to do. So if there's a project, if there's a task, the leaders have a responsibility and the Leadership Council members are those students that committed to be on those meetings all the time and help out with projects that come up. Spartan Series today is a great example of that and Laura will tell more about it. So it's not necessary to be on the Leadership Council to do leadership tasks. But if you're on the council, we expect you to take those on. On top of this, by the way, you can see mentors around this. There are lead mentors, like I am one of them, working with the leadership team to get everything done. And there are specific mentors per area that are paired to the student, and they help them coach them throughout this process. About mentors in general, uh, a question we often get like, what kind of team are you? Are you student driven, mentor driven? Uh, we're a bit of both. Um, we like to operate in two different modes. Right now in our off season, we are a team that is mostly student driven. There's a reason for that because we mentors like some time down, you know, just to take some time off and do other stuff. But also very importantly, believe that's the best way for our students to develop the skills they need during the season. So they organize our off-season events. They built the third robot, which is out there. Um, they train. They do all that stuff. And you're going to give more examples, so I'll not steal your thunder on that one. But it's very important for us that during the off-season, the students are as much as possible responsible for the team. Once the season starts, we switch into a mode where it's more mentor-driven. Um, you know, in order to build the robots that we like to build, you need mentor involvement and a pretty deep mentor involvement as well. So there we switch to a mode where mentors are more leading certain aspects of the design of the robot. Um, we're going to be closer on, robot, you know, on our competition readiness. I'm going to be looking Taya more in the eyes and say, are we really ready? You know, where I'm now looking at her and say, yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Then because of the short time frame that we have to get everything done, we're going to be more involved than we are during the off season. That is the biggest change. The other thing is, because of that, this, the way we look at our leadership students is, we expect them to be able to do their job, but we know they're not 100% ready for it. You're high school students, you, know, you, you haven't done all that stuff. So we, we put in this idea of, we're going to give you a task, but we know it's going to be a stretch. In the past, we overstretched people. We got to the point that people were just basically burning out on a roll because they, they were asked to do too much that was out of their ability to develop. So the combination of an off-season where you can train and then going into the season where you know, there's a higher level of performance required, we have said like we want to see in a leadership student that it is a, roughly a 30% stretch of their capabilities, their skill sets to perform this role. So it needs to be a little bit uncomfortable, but not to the level that they don't feel comfortable anymore doing it. Yeah. So, and that 30% is where we as mentors step in, help, coach, if need be, you know, take over and, and, and lead the way by setting the example. That goes for designing the robot, that goes for the manufacturing process, that goes for the leisure process. All the aspects of what we discussed are subject to that same idea. The rest I will not read out loud. I think you, you can do that. Um, the other part of this role structure that we had is um, we had to change that model. And this might sound very obvious, but the role model created a, a unwanted side effect. We had, at some point, people that were just only focused on their role, and that's it. 
and we want more engagement. So we moved to a model where we went from role to task based organization. And why did we do this? Roles are very, very focused on the title. I am the lead for something and that's what I'm going to be doing. I know it looks great on your resume, but it doesn't say anything about what you achieved in the team. So we wanted to get to a model where we're focusing on tasks with concrete outcomes that, again, you can still put them on your resume, but there's not, not a title behind it. You're, you know, you're part of a robotics team. Um, we want to be able to assign those based on your skills, your motivation, and your commitment to the team. So if you show up a lot and you're a freshman, oh, you can easily be somebody that has a huge role in the design of the robot. If you show that skill, you show that commitment, we're happy to give you that role. Um, the role-based model also created a kind of singular focus for a season, like, oh, I'm in this pillar right now and that's what I'm doing for the whole season. The model to go to a test base creates more options to shift between stuff. Now, can you shift between hardware and software the whole time? Usually not. But we do create more options to say like, hey, I'm going to be involved in entrepreneurship, but at the same time, I can still be involved in doing the design for a robot. It's easy to move around. And of course, um, and I'll show that in a bit, we also felt that this is going to be broadening the skills that you develop in the team. Um, and as an example, this is kind of the visualization of what I just said, is you know, if you're in a role model, you're, you're pretty much taking care of that role. And I'll give you one example um, of our, I think, 2020 season. We had one student that was, a, was responsible for drawings. Great. The result of that model was that that person was sitting behind one of those uh, machines, and it was literally people coming here, here's drawings that need to be made. And that was the only thing that student was doing during the whole season. Yeah? And you can say, well, why didn't you change that? Well, we tried to, but everyone's like, yeah, but that's the lead for drawings. That's his responsibility. He needs to do that. And he didn't get, Lily didn't get away from his PC at some point just making drawings. Now, with this change and the way we set this up, we're now saying we're organizing ourselves a little bit different in subsystems, and Laura will tell a bit more about that in detail. But drawings is just a skill that everybody needs to learn and everybody needs to do. So now, if you're part of a subsystem like, for instance, the climber, the drawings are made within that group. Is there a lead for, for drawings? No. There's a lead for a subsystem. And in that group, all the tasks that are needed are being executed. So instead of having drawings, design, or whatever, manufacturing, and you're in that pillar, you can basically just roam around between these different things. Now, that might sound, if you listen to it, like, that's not really trivial. For us as a team, it made a big difference in the way we organize. Um, we are now seeing that most of the students are involved in more areas of the, of the team, are encouraged to learn different skills, and during the season are more multifunctional. So it kind of grew on us, but over time when we evaluated, hey, why are we sometimes stuck in certain areas, changing this simple principle opened up way more opportunities for most of the students that we have on our team. Now, this is the theory. Let's see how this works in real life. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the application of this. You can move to the next slide. Yes. This is how this plays out in a season and starting from off season. So in order to have a strong leadership team, you need a team to begin with. So as a robotics team, as all of you know, we lose 25% of our team. We lose our seniors every year due to the fact they graduate. And that's our most experienced part of our team. So an important part that we focus on is recruitment. This is a photo here of our open house event. And we have, this is a student organized event. What we do here is we have all these different booths um, where the leads or people involved in all these different subsystems um, talk about the team and what they do on the team. This is a good way to get the community involved and people to know more about our robot. And this is a leadership opportunity. Like, this is something that needs to be done. This is a task, per se. Like, it's not a role. This is not your role to organize open house. It is a task that comes up. And we brought it up to our leadership council this year. And one of our leadership council students took this up and was able to create an event where we were able to get a bunch of recruitment from. So that's one success of this task was this role model. And same student was able to do other things in season. All right. Oh, I'm oh, wrong direction. Going in the wrong direction. Sorry about that. Okay, and once we've recruited people, we have a bunch of new students. Uh, we are focused on 
getting them up to the next level. So no matter what skill level you come in, uh, we're going to bring you up to the next one. And this is in another place where leadership is needed, where we have the older students passing it down to newer members. And it is all in the idea of learning. So you have the mentors who have taught the students, and the students will now teach other students. So in season, a mentor had tool trained me. Now in the off season, a leadership task is making sure we onboard all these members. So this is training new students. We've got 105 students tool trained in this last off season, and that's in like the last four months. Um, so we've done an emphasis on onboarding, and in order to get this impact, we have like a team of students who are working on this. And um, here are some students, and then now. Um, they are involved in the manufacturing of our third robot. So this allows them to have a diverse range of skills. We even train people on software. So if they are like, they know the safety features of both mechanical, like the basics, as well as they can work on software. And yes, go for uh, it. I'm just curious um, how you balance uh, the time of the experienced students between improving their own skills and teaching the, the new folks. So on my team, I've seen that in the, in the off season, like almost like 80% of the folks' time goes teaching new folks. So they don't actually get a whole lot of skill them themselves. How do you kind of balance that? Just keeping the interest in everything. So we have two ways. We have two pathways. Um, how we advance experience, we do it through our third robot. So while we are teaching these new students through the third robot project, we're kind of taking on the role of mentors in season. We're the ones who are pushing the innovation, pushing how the design is working, but putting those specific tasks to people who are newer, teaching them how to do it, guiding them in that direction. And that both strengthens our understanding of how things work, as well as more of our softer leadership skills. So maybe we aren't technically getting our, that technical practice, but we're getting the soft skills, which are needed to run more efficiently during the build season. Yeah, and also by now spreading these responsibilities across a larger population of students, it's not limiting them too much. It takes some time, but it allows yeah. them to develop skills. But at the same time, there's plenty of time left to work on their own projects and do their own stuff. Yes. This is media. so. Kind of on your point, how do you develop skills? How do you balance your time? Uh, we, people solely don't focus on like mechanical entrepreneurship. Uh, we have students who work on electrical maybe in season. And then this is a community event where we actually were on local television um, just to get our self out there. This is at the Mountain View Tech Showcase. Uh, we had, this is how we rise up to challenges. Like this was sporadic. They came up and was like, hey, can we interview you? Um, in the moment, it was like, who felt confident enough to step up? Um, there's no like, okay, you're the media person, you're the spokesperson of our team. It's the people there, and we build the confidence to just step up to ad hoc opportunities. This is, some of this might look familiar to you. This is our pitch for Spartan series, our Instagram page. Um, we had a lot of students hard at work to make this event happen. And that all falls under our tasks. So each of these was a task. So we had people who worked on the infographics, people who worked out like the time slots, um, who did a lot of the coordinating, made sure there was like food here for the event. And we split that up under one person who was in charge of running the event, and that was their task. Their task was to make sure Spartan Series happened. From there, there was all these like people who they worked with in order to make this event here to get all of you here. Um, and that's through our media sub team. And this is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship will cover multiple things. We have our media, we have our outreach as seen in the previous slide. We also have our team development with the tool training. Uh, we have our school relations and as you all know there are awards in first. So we have team working on that. Our lead for that's behind the camera, Maya. So she stepped up to the task of working on awards this year. All right, so we, are, we drive a student focus. This is us at championships. In order to get here, we strive for excellence from design to execution. Um, these are a bunch of student leaders. They all like worked on various parts of their team and gained experience both competition 
like scouting, pit crew, drive team, as well as building up the robot. Um, we have drivers who are not only focused on driving, but they're also building mechanical subsystems and s part of software. This is the start of the season. In order to get here, as we say, we start from design and execution. We have students who are all jumping up, sharing ideas. There's an equal opportunity kind of platform here. This is kickoff. Uh, we like to stress the idea that everyone's ideas are equal. We don't have like, okay, the captain's idea is the best idea out there for robot design. Uh, we want to have the newer voices shine as well, and that's why we break into smaller groups so it's less intimidating for ideas to be shared. And this is one strategy to get more involvement, and then we decide leadership positions and, and leadership roles based on involvement and based on commitment. So it starts in kickoff and it goes through prototyping. And that's when we formalize, go ahead, we formalize leadership roles, but then there's like informal leadership. Like at the end of a competition, you often will see us cleaning up. This is the rolling up carpet. Can you raise your hand if you've rolled up a carpet before? Yeah. Would you say that's an extremely hard thing to do? Yes. Yes. <laughs> To do properly, yes. To do properly, yeah. Good. So imagine the giant field size ones. We'll get like 20 people in a line rolling this up. It may take us 40 minutes, but we get it done in the end, and that's through people communicating, stepping up. Um, we don't have a carpet rolling lead. I feel like you'd probably agree that's mildly absurd, um, but this is a task. Um, people in competition are like, okay, we need to get this done. Let's be competitive. Let's see like how well we can do this. Often there's like two halves of the carpet, and we're like, okay, you're gonna lead this side, you're gonna lead this side, we're gonna see who can get this done first. Just to make it fun, and that's spontaneous. And that's part of the structure we've developed where people are just comfortable to step up and take leadership when needed. And that builds trust in our team and in, in each other. So uh, people have seen the application of our leadership students um, and how we execute, which leads to event organizers. Like 971 students and student leaders were trusted to pack the entire competition in a truck. So we took everything down. They're like, hey, we saw you communicating. I think you got this. Hands us a paper of how we're supposed to lay out the entire truck. And someone takes it and they take ownership of it. Um, and this is some, an example I want to highlight. This is not something you see like technically robot building, um, but communication is really important. Um, learning to speak and talk with other people um, is efficient in both your robot setting as well as like moving things. Uh, and I find that really helpful. Uh, can the people in the back hear me? If you talk to me prior to robotics, the front row maybe could hear me. Um, I'd say robotics gives you a really good place to build up your leadership um, and you can step up to opportunities like this. So just kind of summarizing, like, why, why do we emphasize so much on this role versus task driven approach? During a season, if we upfront assign all these leadership positions, you get, the, get kind of this role based locking. You know, the student's going to be doing what they were assigned to do. There's little to no kind of challenge to you to do something else. Because you're the lead for that topic and you could basically sit and wait until it passes. Your desk can take care of it. With this approach where we say like, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to give anybody an upfront leadership role unless you know, you're one of the, the four top leaders because we need some structure in place. It becomes very fluid. So during a kickoff, we as mentors based on the performance during the season can see like, hey, that student is really engaged in that subsystem. He or she can lead it. Yeah, and then that's a responsibility. However, if that person is not capable or not stepping up to the task or not delivering, it's also very easy, and it sounds harsh if I say it like this, to say like, hey, I don't think this is fitting you. Either we can help you, or we're going to let somebody else take over that is more suited for the job. It gives us more flexibility, more fluid uh, approach towards what's happening. In the past, you're kind of, yeah, firing somebody from their role and then assigning somebody else. Now it happens more in a natural way. And with that, it becomes very obvious, like you know, we as mentors can tell our students, like, we're going to judge you on your performance, not on your title. If you deliver what you expected, and we know you're learning, we know you're going to make mistakes, we're going to be very nice to you and very kind about that. But at some point, if we see like you're struggling, and we had this last year with some students there, we're just struggling in a role, and we talked to them and we came to the conclusion, it's not a good fit for you. 
step, step back, take a smaller task, more overseeable that you can organize, and we'll find somebody else that can take over the other parts. It allowed us to really quickly reorganize without losing a lot of cycles in time. Um, that is not to be you know, mean to a student. Sometimes you just get yourself into a role that is you know, maybe asking too much from you. You, know, you, have house, you, know, you have your homework results that are not getting there and you know, your parents are calling us usually. You know, we, we do have those chats every now and then. And it helps to say, okay, we can just scale down because we're not in some fixed system of, of too many leaders and give you a role that fits what you can do better. And we believe that if you achieve something, if you finish a role with success, that builds your confidence, it builds your skill set. And then next season, based on that, let's try again. Let's pick on a bigger task. And that's how you develop through the team. And that's what we see happening right now. The second be benefit is that we have people come in like a freshman and they just show extremely you know, good skill set during the first months here. If we would fix that role, that means that they have to wait a whole year. Now we can easily promote somebody to the level that they actually execute on. And that is a very important part, is, you know, the amount of students that we have nowadays, for us to be able to say like, hey, you're doing a great job, come on, try this. Step up to the plate. So we're encouraging people to develop quicker and do other stuff as well, more skills. So with all the examples, there's a formal structure, there's still one, but there's a lot of focus on the informal ad hoc step to the plate attitude. And if you're doing your job and you're doing great, you can grow really rapidly. So it's a balance, but that's the whole idea behind it. Go ahead. So um, this is all very interesting, the task-based system. I haven't heard of it before. But so say on the micro levels, like you're, um, you're trying to design a subsystem, say a shooter for the robot. Yes. And something specific needs to get done, like you need to CAD this subpart of it. Yeah. That, would that be a task in and of itself that, um, that an individual student could take on? Or is that, or is, or tasks are usually more of a bigger thing, like um, getting something done in that way? Uh, you're, yeah. you're leading so subsystems, so yeah. you can explain this. Yeah. So I've led a couple <laughs> subsystems, climber and season, intake third robot. And your question on the micro tasks, yes. Like those do get delegated out to people. So you have your subsystem lead and they're responsible for the execution and delegating those tasks out by splitting them into micro tasks that people can take up. Like CAD is not just going to be one person. I can tell you in my subsystem, we had 15 people working on CAD for the same thing on the same document at the same time, um, which allowed us to make iterations a lot faster since we had so many people working on it and they knew their, they just had their one thing that they made and they all worked together on it. By the way, tools like Onshape that we've been starting to use since the uh, COVID season have made this whole principle a lot easier. In the past, we had some technology challenges. We would do something. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to say what, but yes. But yeah. Um, I haven't heard much of anything today about business or money, and yet okay. robotics teams spend a non-insignificant amount of money. Correct. So, yep. I guess, kind of, is there any student involvement with? obtaining the money and financing money and does each subteam have a budget and how does that work? Okay, I can take this as well. So under entrepreneurship, one of our teams is sponsors. So we work on engaging and rec like retaining sponsors um, as well as like getting new sponsors through um, emailing, through connections. And we have a team's treasurer who works with mentors to create a budget and we don't have an overall subsystem-based budget. We have an overall robot budget. And under that, we have a purchasing list. And when you purchase a part, you identify where it's going. So is this going to be a consumable part? Is this going to be a robot part? And from there, we, every week at our leadership meetings, we do an update on where our budget is. But again, here you see with sponsoring, there is a, a sponsor lead right now. It takes care of the overall sponsoring. But there's a grant that needs to be written. In the, yeah, in the past that would be, oh, you're, 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 you're in charge of that. And all these grants were one person writing it. Now we got four or five people involved in that. And those grants are being written by multiple people. As mentors, we still overlook, when, before they go out, we will we'll look at it. So that's a way to get money in, yeah? To your point, budgeting, she said, you know, we have a budget. Deviations of the budget are going to that leadership council and are discussed there. And that's where we decide 
whether or not we want to invest money left or right, or we want to spend more on uh, a project. Like one of the important things on our third robot is that we use the minimum budget on that. You use what's ever available in the lab, and only things that are really needed are being ordered. If somebody comes like, but we want to try something really cool on the third robot, and it requires us to invest $2,000, then you have to go to the leadership council, make your case, and get, get budget for that. And what are the downsides of a task-based system? Um, so far, we haven't found a lot, to be honest, but we're, we're learning. Um, I, I think for, with the roles, there was kind of like, I could apply for a role and I kind of knew what, what, what was out there in ta in, in the, uh, with the task. We haven't yet gotten to the point that every task that is possible is defined, so as a student, when you come in, you can figure out, like, I would love to do that. It's, it's, you need to be here or be at the leadership meetings and, and raise your hand. So we don't have a nice catalog that says, like, oh, I want to work on this or that. Um, so I think that is something we, we, we probably need to kind of advertise better what are the different things you can do. A lot of that currently happens ad hoc during the meetings. Um, I'll take you first and then I see two hands there as well. Sorry. Uh, my question has to do with how you track uh, progress on your task. Do you use a tool like Trello or something like that? What, what is your mechanism? Can I take this? Can I take this? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> High school students and planning, that is your question. Um, very good. Uh, it's not up there right now. Usually we have a big tracker on that wall which defines all the tasks and we keep track of. Um, I, <laughs> I say, yeah, how, how to best track the progress uh, um, of everything is right now, for the next season, we are in a discussion to use more like an online tool like Trello or another planning tool. Um, because it's been, in my opinion, one of the weak, and I'm saying this as a mentor right now, um, as, as one of the weak spots of the team uh, over the years, just getting stuff done in time. Um, and I will not blame the students for this alone. There are also mentors that can improve on that. Um, but yes, we, ne we need to find better tooling for that. Um, it has been on paper in the back of this classroom, and we kind of kept track of it. And I just saw a lot of red on that at some point. And I'm like, but yeah. who's concerned about this? And it's like, well, yeah, we still know we need to go to, you know, to San Francisco Regional. Yeah. One of the things that happened, and I think that's more behind what your question is, when we had a captain model, and the captain was really focused on building the robot, there was not a natural tension between you know, being ready for a competition and having a robot ready. Um, if you had a captain that was really invested in, in building a robot, you know, until the day before, and we lost bagging day, so, you know, that kind of took away that natural moment in time. Uh, up to the days before the competition, they would still be building a robot. Now with a competition lead, I got somebody that is very invested in having that robot four weeks before the first the competition starts, and pushing the team and her peers in the team to be ready in time, so we can have driver practice. So. Part of that is tooling, but more important for us is that that top leadership structure with these four roles, and I literally just had a conversation outside with three of them about something that happened yesterday where, you know, it's all about planning. It's like, Taya, as our competition lead, she needs to make sure that when we do driver practice, we got a usable robot. So that means that her two peers, hardware and software, Bill and Marissa, I will call them out by name here, need to make sure that they're ready. And as a leadership together, they are responsible for making that happen. And so if something goes wrong there, we go back to them and say, hey, how do you solve this, guys? How, wh what happened? Why didn't, did this go wrong? What can we do better? And you can point at individuals that were working on certain stuff and say, like, yeah, they were, it's your responsibility. You have to agree on timelines. And now I got somebody that will be chasing down that timeline better than we had in the past. So the person who owns a cap, you keep that person accountable. But it's all about accountability, yeah. but also having a certain, I would say, conflict of interest inside a leadership team yeah. that, you know, if you're responsible for the competition, you want a robot as soon as possible. If you're responsible for hardware and software, you guys want to wait until the, you know, the dying moment to fix and do everything you like to do on it. We need to find that optimum. I'm just going to take the other questions first, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, you mentioned having, like, over 100 members, which is great, but it is mm -hmm. a lot of kids. So when mm -hmm. you, like, during build season, for example, when you have a meeting, do you have, like, 130 kids in a room, or do you, like, divide it, and sort of what does that look like? What does your schedule look like? How do you split it? That kind of thing? I can yeah. go. Just repeat the question just briefly. 
All right. Uh, the question was talking about how we manage um, a large amount of students during build season and how the distribution of that looks like. Uh, during build season, we often have students committing various hours. Um, you'll have a core team um, of maybe 20 students uh, to 30 students who are showing up consistently at all meetings. And we also were working a lot outside during build season this year, which helped us with the space and with the layout. Um, partially, well, mainly because of COVID, we were trying to stay outside as much as possible, and that gave us more space to work as a team. And then when we got to machines, it was people who were specifically working on those machines in those spaces. And we kind of had that like space so we don't crowd areas. But overall, keeping over 100 people busy is a challenge. Yeah. Um, on an average meeting, we track attendance, so everybody scans in. I would say our Wednesday evening meetings are the busiest meetings. Um, I think our maximum was around 70 people at the same time. Um, even though we have a hundred, over 100 people on the roster, I believe a lot of them will fall off during a build season because everybody went through a build season knows there's a certain intensity to it. Um, but even if it's 70 people left on the roster, it's, it's a huge team. So yes, we're looking at how we're balancing that out better and uh, keep everybody busy. Um, I think an important part of this is what Laura is doing, developing our entrepreneurship program more. So there's more work to be done on the team than just building the robot and doing outreach that gives more opportunities there as well. And I'll take that question. Um, does this put more load on the few kind of role-based roles that are left? Because it looked to me that you had a uh, power lead, a software lead. Those are somewhat of a role-based mm -hmm. assignment. So does it put more load on those few people that are left to be creating these lists of tasks to be done? So the question is like, is, is there more of a... Basically have those people be aware of more things at the same time, basically, yeah. opposed to being able to let the individual focus areas actually have a very deep knowledge of what needs to be done in that area. So yeah, your, your question is like, is, is there more load on the roles that are remaining, the four top roles that we have uh, yeah. defined? Have, have you seen and and, and that's on those roles? Yeah, and how can they develop themselves and, and, and have the depth in there? Yeah. Um, you have more experience, practical experience. What I am observing is actually no. Um, one of the things that we have been focusing very much on is more delegation. What we saw happening in the old model is everything went upstairs. So, you know, there was a lot of overhead in, in having alignment between all these leads and, and, and everything that's going on there. Now, because it's more task oriented, it's, it's direct align and we, del we focus a lot on doing a lot of delegation. And you can disagree with me, but I'm observing more of actually get more time for them to do hands-on work because they need to trust in a peer that takes care of it. And it becomes easier to kind of say like, hey, oh, you're the scouting lead. You're busy. You're not able to do what you do. I'll just pull somebody else in and, and divvy up a task and say like, hey, just do this together. Yeah. I can use this as an example. Um, I'm the lead for entrepreneurship, which means I'm overseeing all the entrepreneurship projects. But I did not organize this. I did not take the lead for this outreach event. That's Nico in the back. Um, he did a lot of work for this. And what he did was I just needed to come in. I needed to check in with him where he was at. Uh, we aligned on deadlines. So we would discuss together like when we need things to get done. And he'd come to me if he needed anything. I could reach out for other students and resources to come help him. Um, but the pressure was not on me to get this entire event together. Um, a team of other students was working on that and I could focus on things like um, maybe tool trainings, team development, and other parts of entrepreneurship. I do agree that if a role model is perfectly functional, you would see the same effect. However, what we saw is that if somebody is the lead for drawings, they have a natural thing like, I want to build the robot as well. And then, oh, you know, you're, you're constantly managing that presence. Now, because it's in t inside this, this subsystem structure, drawings are being made in the subsystem that is responsible. For, you know, if you're doing the climber, you do drawings, manufacturing, design, all that stuff. It's easier. You don't have to worry too much about it. So for us, it works out very nicely. Um, there might be a season where I regret saying this. I don't know yet. But so far, so good. Is the subsystem model... Uh actually part of the task base or are those two separate 
changes would happen at the same time? No, oh, that's, that's a very good question. The, the subsystems that we refer to, and we took out the slide about it because we felt it was a little bit too technical. I can no. draw. Go ahead. Okay. So, you have two ways of this table. You have your tasks up here, so T1, T2, T3. So, original model, you had your roles, so drawings, hold up. Did no, I that's the subsystem backwards? role. The, yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah the subsystem. I did this backwards. Yeah, so this would be cli intake, for instance, or climber, yeah. Climber. Just taking a robot example that everybody knows. <laughs> Intake, drivetrain. Okay, so instead of having one person take ownership of all of those tasks, so say those drawings, that it complete the drawings for all of these, Climber is now responsible for taking the drawings, the CAD, and the manufacturing all together. So th that, that was kind of a switch in our thinking. And for some, it might be yet yeah, as obvious, but we were very much focused, like, you know, got the disfocus in. You know, let's say if, you know, drawing is a great example. It needs to be done in every one of these. That, you know, that person just does drawings. That's, at some point, you're kind of like, I've done enough, or they've done can. The, the second benefit for us is that now in every of these teams, there's somebody that can do drawings. So instead of having one student, we got three or four students being able to do it. It does require a little bit more investment on the training front, but that's what we do in the off season. But do the captains or the mentors? Sorry, yeah. Do captains and leads do the delegation and are responsible for keeping people accountable, or is that a mentor thing? Okay, so who do who? Yeah, so yeah, the who's responsible for do we as mentors keep the accountability, or is that the role of the lead? Mm -hmm. And Prim and primarily, we leave it up to the leads to do it. Um, we will coach them and ask them questions, but when it becomes a problem, like we see stuff not going right, that's when we intervene. And we do remain, you know, kind of reserve the right to say like, that might not be a good thing. One of the things we want to avoid is that Laura has a great group of friends on the team, let's pull all my friends around me. So we focus very much around inclusivity, so we will challenge her like, is this really the best person for the job? You never do that, by the way, I'm just, this is, <laughs> Yeah, uh, just to be very clear. So we will always challenge like, hey, is this really the best person for that job? Is it not just the person that you like and like to work with? Because before you know, you get these like small cliques of people that just like each other and work. So on the leadership level and choosing the roles, it's purely mentors. So you interview over it and we pick the people. And part of that process is that we also make you very much aware that we expect you to delegate and involve the whole team. If we see a group of friends kind of sticking in one area, that's when we intervene and say, like, I think we should spread this across multiple people. But in general, the principle is the lead is trusted with the responsibility to assign these roles to and delegate to the students around them. Yeah. Okay. So this is actually very similar to this question. Uh, so coming from a team that has very few mentors, uh, when uh, when I'm thinking about the feasibility of doing a task-based leadership structure where everything's extremely subdivided into like small, small things that you each assign to different people, uh, an issue that I think might co uh, come up when you have when you're low on mentors is that each of these tasks would just like we have no one to make sure each of them is going on track. We don't really have enough people to make sure that each of these like a giant sea of tasks would just devolve into like you know a bunch of unfinished things. Right, so I just wanted to know if you had any commentary or advice. If you don't have as many mentors, you don't even have as many leads, how would you subdivide or would you even want to subdivide that much? So how do we deal with, you know, if you have not enough mentors for the tasks that you have at hand and how do you kind of... So I think you have a great yeah. answer on that because I know we had that discussion. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. Hmm? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so for task delegation and being responsible, that can fall to students. Like um, my subsystem um, during the season, um, we didn't have enough mentors to have a mentor on every subsystem. So I didn't have a mentor working with me on my subsystem for a good half of the season. And which meant that that was on student leadership to delegate all those tasks and make sure they were getting done. So it's the self repelled like you have that one person who's in charge of subsystem. Um, but they're just breaking it into small tasks and they kind of take on the role of accountability. Yeah. The other part of this is 
I said something about stretching 30%. Yeah? yeah. One of the things we do before we start the season, like a third of all, we, we talk about complexity index, and you can apply that on every area in your team. We basically upfront try to assess how much can we take on. So if you're low on mentors, it means that we cannot build a very complex robot. That will not fly. It's just overeating yourself. So one of the things that we have done in, in this season, and a lot of people laugh at, it, at me when I say this, we built a relatively simple robot. Now, yes, I know that, that sounds odd, but for our standards, this year's robot was relatively simple. Yeah. And we, had a, we have a method to calculate that. We did this because this season, when we were starting up, we knew we were low in experience on our students. We also had to bring in a couple of new mentors, and we had to get them up to speed with our methods and way of working. So it was very natural for us to say, let's, you know, this year just not try to do something completely crazy that we normally like to do. Yeah? So, yes, we do try to upfront kind of assess how much do we take on. For the third robot, this, this index is even lower because we said to the students, you can try to build a full-fledged robot, but you're probably going to be, you know, spending a lot of time fighting stuff. So build something that has less complexity, but you can finish and be successful with. Yeah. So that is how we deal with it. It's basically setting the right expectations up front. Because if, if the problem that you just described occurs, that we're running out of mentor coverage, we are probably doing something that is too complex for this team to manage. And the team is the mentors and the students together. So that's how we deal with it. So um, I'm wondering on, so, on, so for different subsystems, um, one thing that I could imagine not working is if, say you have a, a team of people working on a subsystem, in the task system, they, maybe people could be dragged between different subsystems on robot. I'm wondering, is that something that happens, or is there people that are almost dedicated to one subsystem, or how does that happen, like, like getting people up to speed, speed on everything? And because if you have people that are just focused on one subsystem, then you don't need to tell them about everything that's going on with the rest of the robot. Yeah, good question. So, so the question is, do you work on one subsystem or can you just jump around between different subsystems? Yeah? I think in general we encourage to be at least involved in one subsystem and, and close, but sometimes if, if there's not a wor enough work, like let's say there's manufacturing work needs to be done for subsystem A. And so we have people that just like to do manufacturing and then there's subsystem B that needs more help. There's no problem for you to move there. Yeah. And it also depends on timing. So you can be super involved in one subsystem and help another subsystem out when that need occurs. Like, I was the lead of one subsystem, but I still helped out with other subsystems when that task arise. So say, in the grand scheme of things, they were the priority um, that needed to get done first, and they needed additional people on it. I would just, we'd just migrate over to fill up and uh, take on those tasks as needed, and you weren't like stuck to your subsystem. Uh, but usually students like work through the entire process. We really like the subsystem model because you learn every step of the way. Um, by following a subsystem from start to finish, you go through each of those steps yourselves and you have a wider like, range of knowledge. And again, we encourage the students' leadership to work together and say like, our goal is to build a functioning robot. Yeah. Your goal as a subsystem lead, if you're optimizing on your own subsystem, you might be ready, but if the rest of the robot is not, you failed in the end. Because the overall team objective is a working robot. So there's, there is, an, you know, it is good to say like, hey, I don't know, some part of the subsystem turned out to be more complex and we need a more experienced cat person on that. Can we change people around? We can do that. We can make that decision to do it. That's the flexibility we always want to have. But I would say that was also possible in the old system. That was not a limitation there. But now this end-to-end -end part that Laura just described, that is the difference. Like you can be involved end-to-end -end and get exposed to all the different parts of building that subsystem. Um, sorry, I saw one there first and then I'll go back to you. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to go back to the amount of students that you guys have on your team. Yeah. And because the number is so high, mm -hmm. um, what, is, what does it look like for you guys moving into competitions, whether it be regionals or finals? Do you guys select students, and if so, uh, what number and why do you select them? So the question is, like, do we have to select for competitions and have sort of a cutoff? Um, it's a great question because it's very, um, for me, it's currently very, uh, you know, an actual topic that I want to work on. Uh, we, right now, 
everybody can come to a competition um, unless we really feel like you have not been contributing, we have the right to say like, no, there's no place for you. Now, the reality is that nobody is going to invest coming to a competition if they haven't been invested in the team. So, so far we haven't had to take roles, but we're going to Madeira, Madtown, in a couple of weeks. I think we're over 60 students. 60 students going there. Just the logistics alone, the carpooling, I'm, I'm glad I have great parents around the team that take care of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, it, it is getting to a point that I don't know if we can keep doing that. And, and you know, one of the roles of the Leadership Council is that we're going to be discussing this topic there. Like, how do we want to work? We're still a club. Can we limit? How can we limit? Do we even want to? Um, I have my personal ideas about it, and I can bring that up in a proposal. And that is what we discuss there. And we look at the pros and cons. And that could be something we d you change next year. Um, you know, we also discuss a lot about the consequences because if you say we're not limiting, maybe next year I need to bring 100 students. I can start my own airline, my own hotel chain almost <laughs> with this team if I wanted to. You know, at some point it becomes that much that it's, it's not manageable anymore. So, you know, part of your learning experience is also if, if you've, you know, if you, I mean, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I work in a normal company, a startup in this case. All these problems occur in real life if you're in the business. Like your, your company grows. How do you structure? Where do you need to start specializing versus having general stuff? Where do I outsource stuff? Where do I do still do it stuff myself? These are all the problems that we want them to think about and work on. And these can sometimes be very unique problems because it's just in time one moment for the team. So we don't know yet. Right now we let everybody come. But I, I cannot predict that it will be the same for the near future. Uh, you, and then I got you. Sorry. Two questions, one shorter. So okay. following up on that. One question at a time, okay? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> What's a follow-up question to that? I had one question. Okay. <laughs> following up to that, champs, are you still bringing 60 people, or did you last we year? We brought and 65, including adults and mentors. Cool. That answers that question. Yes. Um, and then... And it went well, by the way. It went very well. <laughs> um, and then, how many mentors are there? I don't think I asked this yet. How many mentors we have right now? I have no idea. Active around 12 to 14. And it depends a little bit on like what kind of mentors you look at. There's also a lot of people around there that are helping with supervision, parents, and, and uh, chaperones, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, I think, 12, 15? 12? Yeah, a core mentorship. More? I'll trust you on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have pretty good reading. Um, and it, it depends a little bit. Right now, it's less. During the season, there are a couple of mentors that, that come back for the season. So it, 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 it fluctuates a little bit. Then mentors yeah. handle the logistics for competitions, not students? No. Uh, both students and parents. We have, a, so we have a couple of re But no, students are actively involved in yeah. helping with the logistics. Yes. Yeah, like Taya, who's in the back, our competition lead, she did paperwork. Uh, for our off seasons, so we have students involved yeah. in that process. Like, because we have to get, since we are a school club, we need district approval and all that complex stuff. But also the transport of the robot, like organizing that with there, there's a truck going, organizing and engaging with that. Yes, we we try to engage, the, uh, keep students involved in that as much as possible. You, yeah. So again, uh, building out the fact that <laughs> building out the fact that you guys have like a hundred teammates. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming they're all wearing to be on drive team. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All of that. <laughs> the problem our team came up with was how do you decide who gets to be on drive team? What's the criteria? Okay. So with 100 people, how do you decide who does the drive team? So I want to take one step back before I answer that question. In our team, we have adopted this philosophy of the score takes care of itself. It's uh, after the book of Bill Walsh. A lot of people think that being on the drive team is kind of like I'm the king of the team. You're not. The drive team is important. It executes the last piece of a long chain. Yeah. So what we are looking at is that if somebody feels that being on the drive team makes you the, you know, the quarterback, the most important person of the team, you're not. That's a very important message that we give them. They're just given a robot, and they need to execute as well as they can. They're dependent on our scouting, our strategy, our pit crew, just during the competition alone, to do their jobs for them to be successful. So there's a lot of other roles that are maybe even more important than just the drive team, that we emphasize that it's not just that during a competition. So that's a very important principle. The same goes for the whole design and manufacturing process. If you've designed a crappy robot, 
A good drive team can make it a little less crappy, but it's still crappy. If you design a really good robot, a poorly trained drive team will still not be able to get ivory out of it. So it needs to be a balance of the whole chain living up to its expectations. That's a very important principle for the team. Yeah, that, that, that I want to say. Now, how do we get to selecting a drive team? Well, uh, we have additions. And it's kind of competitive, yeah. And every year we're lucky that we find one or two good people. We let them do a playoff and um, they have to commit to going to all the competitions. And when they do, they can get that role. If they do not perform well enough or somebody else turns out that you know, every year we do the auditions to be better, then we swap you out. We are on that part really looking at we want the best person there. Um, is the best person always the person that can drive fastest or whatever? No, it's the person that can handle the robot as a driver in the best sure. possible way. Deal with it when it breaks down on the field, switch quickly on strategy, so there's a lot coming to that. Um, I want to emphasize, we don't trade them as the superstars on the team. They're just one part of a very functional chain that we have. You had a question. I, I passed five times and you saw about that. Oh, that's totally fine. Um, more, more important to, ask, to answer the students' questions than mine. This is a communication question. You, whatever your structure is, whether it's uh, role-based or, or task-based, there's an importance to understanding as the person who owns that task or that role what their responsibilities are. Yeah. How do you, what mentors too? How do you communicate that as nine seventy one? How do we communicate the responsibilities that come with a task? How do you okay. know when you get a job what means to execute that job? This is a really good question. I think right now this is kind of implicitly taken care of. Um, a lot of the, uh, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll let you take a step at it. I'm kind of thinking through like how we do it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, a lot of understanding comes from looking at past examples of what has been done. Um, if you take a look at a robot, you need to know that this needs to get done. Um, usually those who are delegating the task, you have the overall big picture, which is used as a reference to your benchmark, whether that be an event like this, where your benchmark is to get a group of people and to share knowledge. Um, you work backwards from that big picture to understand um, how big your role is and what needs to be accomplished. So say your role is recruitment for a Spartan series. You look back and be like, okay, what is going to be effective? Is this sending out, so that will then in your task, you'll need to like send out individual emails to all the teams, social media, things like that, that all falls under because you know your big picture goal is to get a large group of people to show up at an event. Does that make sense? Or are you looking for something more robot specific? Not, not necessarily, it's more a question of do you have a point in your season where you sit down and say, okay, you're a lead. This is what that means. You're a mentor. This is what that means. This is what you're actually signing up for. And this is what we expect from you. And this are the consequences of not doing what we expect from you. Yeah, okay. So when, you, when we have our leadership uh, selection, it's not an election, it's a selection, uh, we upfront publish the roles. They have a description of what is expected from you, and we also make very clear like how we're going to be expecting you to drive. Like, so for example, if with the drive team, you know, right. if you're going to be in that position, this is what we expect from commitment. That for those roles is very clear. All the other ones are, um, underneath it, or that are derived from it as as task leaders, right. we just apply the overall principle that we tell every student when they join the team. We're a club. If you come here. It's up to you how effective and how much you get out of it. If you're going to be sitting in this room in the corner and you're not going to take it seriously, you're just going to be here on Wednesday evenings. And I can tell you, I had these, I have these situations where a student comes in, sits down in the corner, starts playing games. Yeah? Yeah. I will walk over and say, like, I have no issue with you playing games. However, not inside this room. You just go outside. Right. You're, you're here as a volunteer. It's up to you. We always tell you, step up, ask questions. If it's not clear, you ask us again, and it's our job as mentors or the students to tell you what to do. Um, on the mentor part, yes, when a new mentor arrives, we typically have a short conversation about team culture, team expectations, and all those kind of things when they're serious about joining. That has a similar uh, tone to it. But mentor's commitment is always kind of like, yeah, you cannot ask a hard commitment, but I do ask, like, hey, what's your intention? Yeah. Right. Uh, so you first. Yeah, I was just going to say, how uh, do you guys 
I guess, reach out to the local community to get mentors? Like, what does that process look like? Because, yeah. you know, it's a big commitment to ask from somebody, especially if you're not, you know, compensating them with money. How do you... Well, yeah. So where do we get our mentors from yeah. and how do we reach out? Um, I think... There, there are a couple of things that happen. So first of all, as a team, 971, we do attract just people out, alumni that come out of college and you know live here in the area and, and, and get here in the industry that come back to us and say like, hey, I want to be on a team. And you know, our, our team is known in the community, so they, they like, uh, they come out. Uh, that doesn't mean that we take on everybody that just knocks on the door. We always want to make sure that they fit the team and you know their expectation of a team fit what we want to be. Um, another part comes just out of the professional environments, like I think Jim, who was presenting here uh, in the beginning, you know, he works for the same company of one of our mentors, and he kind of got dragged in. I personally came in here because my son started uh, as a student, as a freshman on the team in 2016, kind of stuck around and, you know, enjoyed the program, and enjoyed doing the, the whole thing. So it's, it's diverse. Um, so far, we've been lucky that that has been a very good influx of people. Um, we do not yet place advertisements like, hey, you want to join. Um, I actually are sometimes I'm looking at it and say like, hey, if you want to be a mentor and you're further away, maybe find a local team that needs mentoring more than we do. Like, you know, I don't need, I mean, in some areas I would love to get a little bit more mentoring. In some areas I'm like, we have plenty of good people. Um, if you have another opportunity, please take it. It depends. So a lot of it happens organically. It's very organically right now, yes. Yeah. And it works so far, so good. So. <laughs> Do you guys have a mentor or student drive coach? Sorry? Do you guys have a mentor or a student drive coach? Mentor, student drive coach, mentor. Yeah. Yes, we believe in that model for long-term stability. Uh, so your answer to the drive team was you want the best person, a best possible person to be on the drive team. Yes. So the question arises, there's a bunch of people who are, ability is very hard to commit to, right? Yeah. You can't commit all of your time and you have a bunch of people who have committed their time, and you have some people who can't, who just can't, and that's not, not their fault, they have other uh, mm -hmm. conflicts. What if that those one person so like, doesn't show up at all, shows up like one time on one weekend, weekday, occasionally, but is like an excellent driver? Okay, so good like question, yeah. Like yes, a uh, great question. So driver selection again, going back to the topic. What do we do when there's this just like, you know, Max Verstappen, Formula One, top driver, generally shows up once, do you pick him over somebody that has been very committed to the team is not as good? We'll take the other one. Yeah, part of the selection is you need to be committed and part of the team. We do not believe you can drive a robot unless you understand how it's put together and a part of the whole process of designing it. And you will see any professional driver being involved in any professional you know, category of teams, they are always talking to their engineers, they know their cars, they know how it works. Do they know the nitty gritty details? No but they are involved in it. So for us, um, our current driver is actually actively building robots. Yep. But at some point, we need to say like, okay, now we need you, <laughs> and you need to start doing driver, pr yeah. driver practice. Yeah, so it, it, it's a balance. So the person needs to cut out the time, but definitely needs to be involved in the team. Now, otherwise, we're just recruiting, uh, you know, a NASCAR driver and, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, nobody else wants to ask a question, so I'll just keep it. No, yeah, what, um, what percentage of kids on the team are on entrepreneurship as opposed to mechanical type stuff? Uh, we have entrepreneurship students who are in mechanical. Like, I am lead for entrepreneurship, but I also be heavily involved in mechanical. It's like how many kids that are in one versus the other? So I'd say we've had like 12 um, students who are like, um, engage in entrepreneurship right now. Uh, we'll pull in more students as needed. So you see some of the volunteers at today's event are maybe not students who are actively in entrepreneurship, but they step up when needed. Uh, we are looking to grow that. We started with a team of three. When I joined the team, we've got to 12, so uh, four times, but we're still looking to grow that department. And I said in my introduction, one of the things that I noticed is our team is, was more tilted towards building robots. And for F first and FRC, we felt that we were not really as strong on the outreach part. Well, we did some stuff, but it kind of happened. And so one of the objectives that you know, I've given Laura is build out a more structural 
entrepreneurship program with outreach sponsoring all that kind of stuff so we're actually actively working on building out a program and and so yeah, so what so. she her job this year is to make something that we can reuse next year and build out yeah so we're building the foundations of our entrepreneurship program this year I'll yes. take that one first and then you so, so sorry. Um, you, you kept alluding to um, freshmen coming in with a lot of skills. Yeah. Um, in my experience on the robotics team, a lot of the freshmen come in with little to no skills at all, right? And I'm wondering, how do you, like, one of the, like, I'm, hmm? one of my ro roles on the team is teaching new members, and how do you go about not only teaching how to do stuff, but how do you teach the process of design? Okay. Look, um, repeat the question. So the question is, how do we uh, work with people who don't come in with skills, correct? Uh, we have an onboarding process, so while there are some people who come in with skill, there's some people, honestly the majority of people who don't know about FIRST or don't know how to do these things, myself included, um, I did not know what a CAD coming to this team. And how we do this is we do this through onboarding presentations and workshops. So we'll hold them as a big group meeting. We'll break up into um, groups and we'll have that 1.2 person. So I was doing a lot of the recruitment. So that meant we were going into classrooms first, recruiting the students, and then onboarding. Uh, when you're onboarding, you're teaching them skills like CAD or doing electrical training, um, code lab. Code lab um, and then you have that contact person who makes themselves available to ask the questions to. And uh, we do a lot of partnering. So with projects, we'll have an older student and a younger student, um, or maybe even the same year, but maybe one has more experience, uh, to teach them the skills. That way, they learn while doing. And then we also have the more formal trainings, like our tool trainings, where we'll have a group of five or four, and we'll have one uh, tool trainer who goes through and has them use all the machines, learn the safety features, and get more comfortable using them. Yeah. Yeah, so sort of building off of that, you mentioned that you don't like enforce any sort of minimum commitment. How do you deal with students who aren't showing up to that training in the off season, but maybe want to start committing more during the season, or otherwise uh, might need to be brought up to speed while more people are busy working on the season projects? Yeah. So Usually, how, that is limited. So, oh. Just, I need to repeat the question. Okay. <laughs> so, how do we deal with students that come in later, didn't go through the training process, let's say on first week of January, and build season starts? So, what do we do in that case? Yeah. Uh, in that case, we often have them work on tasks that don't require that training. We can train them while doing. Like, we'll have a lot of shadowing. Like, if you want to learn how to design things, they'll shadow someone who's working on design and gain that experience as they go. Uh, we'll have less, like, physical tool training sessions just because those machines are being used to build the robot, which is why we emphasize your commitment during the off-season. So the off-season is where we build up our skills. Yeah, I would say, in general, if a student shows up first weekend of January and says, I want to join the robotics team, I will have a chat with them and explain them that the experience that first half year will not be really great. Unless you have a background in FRC and have done this all before you, but if you, let's say you're totally, you know, blank, I'm going to be very honest, like we have no time to train you. We, we can, you can do what Laura just said, but it's, it's mostly up to you to get up to speed because I, I cannot ask mentors to sit down and, and go through the basics. Okay. Now, there, there, you know, sometimes you have a transfer student that comes in and you will try to facilitate that if you see somebody who's really motivated and really wants to do it. But in general, we're going to be very honest, honest and say, like, your experience on the team for this first six months is going to be different than the other students. You can give it a try, but this is what you can expect from us right now. That usually um, is a good conversation to have. Some say, I will just give it a try, and they come up and they, they, they have so much motivation they will come through. Um, we see, you know, if that happens, most of them kind of, after two weeks, they kind of experience like this is really intense. Because if you don't show up in the weekend, you know, you're 20 hours behind the team. So that kind of stuff usually filters out really quickly. But when somebody's really motivated and wants to be part of the team and, and step up to the plate, we'll do whatever we can reasonably possible to make that happen. And there are some self-paced tutorials we have as a team where students can take it upon themselves to build their skills. Um, like during the season, I got my I got cam trained through tutorials, uh, just because that need arise that I needed that skill to be successful. 
Okay. Go ahead. Go on, Roy. Okay. Uh, one question. Um, similar thing for the leaders, the ones yeah. that have been selected into a position. Do you have a more minimum quantitative fence requirement that they can kind of fit? Oh, yeah. So do we have requirements for our leadership? Yeah, I mean, basically it's expected that they are here the majority of the time. That doesn't mean every meeting because, you know, there's other stuff they have to do, um, but a significant amount of time. So, yes. Um, we're not putting a number on that. But it's kind of obvious, you know, if, if you're not here <laughs> and you're in that position, you know, things are going to be slipping away from you. And as a mentor, we will be, you know, observing that and start talking with you about like, hey, does this work, work out? Um, sometimes it means we need to de you know, rescope your work a little bit more and, and see what, where you need help, delegate more stuff. Um, but yeah, you cannot do a leadership role without being, being here. Now the good news is I have not really had to have a lot of discussion with here. Sometimes I actually have the discussion about, do you actually go home? You know, when do you do your homework, that kind of stuff. So it's usually the other way around that we kind of also monitor the other side of that balance. I mean, we love, Students doing robotics, but it needs to be part of a balanced lifestyle. And you know, you have your school, your sports, all the other stuff as well. So, you know, even though it's super cool and fun to do, um, you, 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 yeah. So, so far, so good. I haven't had to have the real the discussion. Like, ah, you're not showing up enough. We need to discuss. Um, I heard you talking about uh, recruiting by going to classrooms. And yes. Stuff. I was curious um, as far as your, you know, meeting, you know. The needs, you know, first this is having a priority on equity, diversity, and inclusion now, and in, you know, I know for our team we've taken a look at okay, what are the, what is the breakout breakout of, of diversity at our school, and trying to see if you know, realizing that we have a bit of a mismatch between who's on our team and who, and who's representing our school. Have you all looked at that, or how how do you try to provide the most uh, the most diverse team? All right, to answer your question, um, looking into the most diverse team through recruitment. Uh, we do classroom presentations and we go through a broad range. Our school had something called AVID. So that's um, classrooms where they help uh, first generation college students or people who would be the first students to go to college. Um, we go to those classrooms and as with all classrooms we'll present on our team overview as well as we want to make sure whenever we're presenting we try and lower the barrier to entry. In any of our present, in like any presentation I give, I will not mention that we perform at a high level. I will never mention like the statistic that we'll like place well in competitions. Um, that's just not something you'll hear me say because that sounds intimidating. I, for one, nearly did not join this team because it seemed scary to me. Um, I was like, yikes, 971, they perform highly. I have no way that I'm going to like know enough to become a part of this team. Um, and so that's something I personally emphasize. I'm like, okay, we need to emphasize that there is a place for everyone. Um, we emphasize the onboarding programs. We emphasize the pathways, and we emphasize how this will impact you past graduation and the steps that will help you in life. And that's helped us get more um, recruitment in those areas. We also reach outside of just STEM classes. Uh, we have a kind of media school. Um, liberal arts type focused uh, school like just that side of us called Freestyle. It's kind of a dual enrollment with Mountain View High School and we also reached out to them um, on getting involved in our team so we get more people focused on maybe less robot but more um, application of their skills. So like the filming of these things, this is where you can apply your skills where you're learning in your film classes into like an industry level projects. So we are limited to the community of the school because we're a club yeah. you need to be a member of the school community otherwise you cannot join of course so within that yes we, we are looking at how can we get underrepresented groups on the team right now yeah. now for multiple reasons we do not track the background of students in the team itself because we don't want to and can I don't want to deal with all the privacy related stuff if we make records of that and um, so we basically eyeball it and, and identify like, hey, are there certain groups that we feel are underrepresented and how can we reach them better? Yeah. Um, and, and Laura is working and she has some great ideas about it, which I think are worth a separate presentation almost um, on how to do it. I'm getting some cues that I need to wrap up, so I'm going to take one more question and then um, thanks a lot. I, I, 
I'm glad to get so many questions. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so you guys were just mentioning earlier the balance between robotics and the regular academics. So do you guys help them in any way with the regular academics in a study hall of any kind? Uh, kind of. Yeah, okay, so. yeah, so on uh, Fridays, uh, we have a robotics meeting from 3 to 7 during build season and now approaching off seasons. Uh, we'll often have students like work on homework and people with s similar classes and uh, that's a place where you can like work on, e work on homework together. A good thing about the revised team is we have people of all grade levels so maybe someone who took the class last year can help you out and um, then you're just here at school you don't have to worry about going home and coming back and you have a good community to work with. So usually the first couple hours there'll be maybe some people in the machine shop, some people like working on homework in here. Um, it's kind of the dynamic. But that's yeah, as, as mentors, unfortunately, it's, it, it, you know, time-wise, not really feasible for us to help and do study. Yeah. And it, you know, we all have our full-time jobs as well. So typically, we, we rely on the students to kind of help each other. Yeah. Now, if some, uh, what happens pretty often, I've seen it here, is that somebody is working on a problem and it's you know, school-related because they're, they're doing some, I don't know, usually it's math or whatever. Then there might be a mentor that says, oh, I can help you with it, and then it becomes like a whiteboard session, then they go through some stuff. But that, that's not kind of a part of the program. It sometimes just happens spontaneously. I mean, we're not going to say, like, yeah, that's not related to robots. We're not talking about it. It's, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, we, that, that's the best we can do. But if we see somebody struggling ad academically, um, yeah, of course, we... We try to kind of talk to them like, hey, how can we guide your, your hours better? Because sometimes it's like, yeah, but if I come here less, will I not be, you know, can I, I might just miss out on certain opportunities. You know, sometimes we, we will have to take away that, you know, fear and say like, well, you know, first things first, you need to graduate from this school. That's your, mo <laughs> your most important objective. And, you know, if you tune it down now a little and you get your results up, then you, you, can, you can come back in. And we know your commitment to the team, we know what you're doing. So that's kind of the more like, I would say, moral support that we try to give, and then we can, can do that. It, luckily, it doesn't happen very often, but every now and then you have to have that chat, like, hey, are you okay? Good. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us.